Hello my friends, welcome back. So I'm sat here underneath the oak tree. Today is Thursday and it may be good weather now but storms are brewing on the horizon. So what a better day and time and place to talk about the storm god, god of thunder whose Anglo-Saxon name was Thunnor but we probably know him slightly better as the Norse god Thor and he plays Chris Hemsworth in the Marvel franchise. So I'm going to be talking about thunder gods today and uh, tracking this god of thunder backwards in time and looking at other parallels in other mythologies of Europe and beyond. Uh, so my friends, if you're uh, new to this channel and like uh, content on mythology and folklore and storytelling in the oral tradition, then why not give me a like and a subscribe and you will get more of it. So Thunor is the god of thunder. His name means thunder. We don't know a huge amount about the Anglo-Saxon god Thunor because not a lot was written about him by the Anglo-Saxons, but we can paint a picture by using later Norse material, principally Icelandic material, and looking at other storm gods in other European mythologies. So I'm kind of going to begin at the end and then work backwards in, in history. Thor's kind of interesting because he was the principal deity that was uh, kind of in rivalry with Jesus, with Christ, uh, as the sort of saviour god of humanity. Uh, just when heathenism was dying out in the fringes of northwestern Europe. So the last places to Christianise were sort of Norway and Iceland, places like that. And there's a really interesting account from the sort of exploits of Eric the Red who explored North America. So this group of Vikings explored and landed in I think uh, present-day Newfoundland in Canada and these guys these expeditions usually ended in failure and these guys were starving. They were all Christians, all of them, but Eric the Red brought with him one adherent of the old religion, one heathen, and he was an old guy and he was a hunter and I, th I think his name was, was Thor or related to Thor, Thorvald or something like that. So these guys were starving, Viking explorers, uh, they had no food, they were praying to Jesus to deliver them and then after a while this old hunter, this adherent of Thor, he had had enough and he wandered off for a few days into the snowy mountains and eventually they found him on top of a mountain uh, invoking Thor for a whale that they could eat and sure enough when they found him they said a whale has washed up and this uh, this old hunter said aha you pray to your Jesus Christ but it was Thor who saved us. Turned out though when they ate the whale meat they all got very 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 sick so they were uh, they took it as a sign from Christ to definitely uh, not follow the heathen religion anymore or so that story goes anyway. Um, but in that story uh, the old hunter says red bearded Thor the thunderer has uh, delivered us uh, or something along those lines. So we have Thor being invoked as a protector of man uh, in this very, very, very late, you know, like the 11th century. This is, this is late. This is very, very late. Um, but that's probably one of the last instances that Thor was invoked, uh, certainly that we have textual evidence for. Thor has a few attributes uh, that are probably common to other Northern European thunder gods as well because they all have, follow a similar sort of archetype. So we've got Thor. Thor is associated with storms. Uh, uh, he's got a hammer. Uh, he likes to hit stuff. He's very hot tempered. Uh, he's got a chariot drawn by goats and thunder comes out of the sound of the chariot wheels. This is a very very old idea. Uh, he's also he's also the god of common people of not of kings or aristocrats but just you or me of peasants farmers fishermen thor if you're into norse mythology you will know is he fights the midgard serpent at the end of time at ragnarok they destroy each other and thor takes nine steps and then dies because of the poison um but thor as serpent slayer or monster slayer this is a very 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 old theme um He's also associated with the lightning bolt, um, uh, drinking, meat, uh, fertility. His club 
is a fertility symbol and is often worn on the necks both of both by uh, contemporary Norse pagans you can see that a lot but also in the uh, in the uh, medieval period as well and earlier I don't know about the Viking period and earlier than that but certainly in Denmark uh, when Christianity is sort of making a lot of converts there's a uh, there's a block which made crosses Christian crosses and Norse hammer symbols. So both of those things were made side by side. Very pragmatic uh, metal worker making uh, uh, sacred objects for both, uh, for both sets of clients, Christian or, or heathen. Um, Thor, also the god of rain. Again, that's a fertility link there. He's also sometimes a sky god. Uh, so not just a, a, a god of storms and rain and lightning and wind and stuff that kind of happens within the dome of the sky, but also for the sky itself and a kind of sky father. That's going to be interesting later because that applies to uh, some other forms of this god, uh, earlier forms. So going backwards in time a little bit, let's talk about the Romans and their interaction with this god. When the Romans were marauding and conquering their way across most of mainland Europe about 2,000 years ago, they came into contact with the Gauls and the Germanic tribes, and they noticed a particular thunder god that they were worshipping. And the Romans themselves equated this god with their god, Jupiter. Uh, and there are many, many, many parallels in terms of iconography and image. Uh, so Jupiter, and also his Greek version Zeus, they are literally pretty much identical. Uh, some similarities with Thor or Thunor are uh, uh, red hair. Not a lot of people know this, but Zeus had red hair. It's written. Uh, he also had blue eyes. That's written of Zeus. He was red haired and blue eyed. Uh, he was also a jolly chap. He was quite affable. He was good natured. Uh, the English name for Jupiter we usually have is Jove. Hey, by Jove, we say. And that means uh, of course, jovial or jolly. So this is another quality that Zeus and Jupiter share with Thunor and Thor. We don't normally see that in representations of Zeus or Jupiter. He's normally quite austere. That's not really correct. That's more of a quality of one of Zeus's older brothers. Uh, but Zeus, he's <laughs> hey, he's 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 out for a good time. Um, He's also obviously associated with lightning bolts. He is also a slayer of serpents. Um, the Romans also sometimes associated this Germanic god, uh, Thunor, with Hercules. Uh, and for good reason, because he was the son of the sky god. Also, Hercules has got a massive club. Another similar quality shared with Zeus and Thunor, Zeus's thunderbolts come back into his hand. Uh, Zeus is also uh, associated with the oak tree just like uh, Thor. He's also associated with the colour blue uh, because he is, of course, a sky god and also the colour purple because of regal connotations. So that is a slight difference between the Mediterranean Zeus and um, uh, Zeus and Jupiter and the northern European storm gods, which is the Mediterranean version is also a sky father, also a sky god, is also king of the gods, whereas Thor is sort of the champion of the gods, but not the king. That place is for the magician, for Odin. Um, and he's also not necessarily a sky god, but some people think that actually perhaps he was both. Uh, so it depends on who you ask with that one. So I've mentioned storm gods now and I've mentioned sky gods. So I think what we need to do now is talk about the Indo-Europeans. We used to call them Aryans. We don't call them that anymore because of that dodgy, mustachioed Austrian bloke and his funny racial theories. Uh, but the Aryans, the Indo-Europeans, sometimes the Yamnaya, these are fairly synonymous terms for a group of white-skinned people that rode out of Ukraine uh, with new technology. They had pointy metal sticks, bronze uh, and bronze axes. That's going to be important later. And chariots, chariot wheels that rolled like thunder and a group of sky gods. And the sort of generalistic picture is, this isn't exactly true, but it's kind of true, is that a kind of um, tree hugging, matriarchal, communistic culture was displaced by this quite violent, warlike, um, chariot riding, horse worshipping, bull sacrificing group of people with pointy metal sticks and a whole 
pantheon of sky gods and storm gods and they were warlike. A lot of the gods worshipped in, in European pantheons in history can trace their roots back to the, this hypothesized, this theorized Indo-European pantheon. So Zeus, uh, we get from the word Deus, which is also the word where we get the word day from, also where we get the word deity from, uh, as in a god. There was probably a separate god of thunder that would have been the son of the sky father and the earth mother, mother earth, that made the champion of gods or men. This would have been a thunder god. So this god went into northern India, where he became Indra the Vedic Indra of the hymns of the Rig Veda. Now, this is not the god of later Hinduism where we've got Shiva and Brahma and uh, Vishnu and Krishna and Parvati and Ganesh and all that. Uh, this is much earlier Vedic religion um, that sometimes we call Brahmanism, but kind of even earlier than that. Uh, and it's very mysterious, shady religion, but we have the god Indra, who is a storm god. He's got blue eyes, he's got red hair, he's got very fierce eyes, and he slays the serpent Vritra. Uh, Vritra, I think it's pronounced. Uh, but this is a kind of primordial, demonic Asura, demon snake, that's kind of got the reign of the sun captive in a cave. And Indra comes along and smashes that snake on the head with a great thunderbolt and kills it, slays the primordial serpent and releases the rains and the sun uh, and saves mankind because crops can then grow. So this conquering champion, king of the gods, that is Indra. Indra is probably almost the most, the most kind of original Indo-European thunder god we have. Um, going up into Eastern Europe, we have Perkunos or Perun. Uh, this is a bit of a blind spot for me as a folklorist. I don't know that much about Eastern European folklore, but I know some of you guys have educated me on this. Perkunos is very interesting because he is also a storm god. He's also associated with oak trees, but he's also associated with a burning oak tree. So uh, literally an oak tree on fire, an oak tree that has been struck by lightning. So this must be a very, very impressive sight. Um, I've never seen an oak tree actually being struck by lightning, but I've seen the remnants of an oak tree struck by lightning. And this, to our ancestors, to see lightning come out of the sky and strike one of these guys and see the whole thing blazing on fire, it must just look like a divine strike from the gods. Um, and Perkonos is, is, is uh, literally um, personified by burning oak log or a burning oak fire, so I believe. This might also be the origin of uh, the Germanic concept of the Yule log, a big oak trunk uh, burnt uh, at Christmas time at Yule. So pagan, pagan threads there. Uh, Perkunos is pretty much, name-wise, maps onto uh, the um, Celtic, pan-Celtic, Gaulish god Taranis. Taranis also means thunder. Now, what's Taranis associated with? Chariot wheels. We find um, bronze chariot wheels all over modern day France and other parts of uh, uh, Celtic Europe. Uh, the wheel symbolizes motion, but also thunder. Uh, so again, we see that idea in much later mythologies of Thor with the thunder coming out of his goat drawn chariot. Taranis also wielded a uh, lightning bolt. Um, he was he was a sky father and a storm god so sometimes you can be both. Um, Taranis is very very interesting. Also etymologically we've got the Hittite god. Hittites are another Indo-European group. They had a storm god called uh, Tarhuna so again very very similar. He also slew a serpent. Uh, he also wielded lightning bolts. So we see this, what is it with all these thunder gods? They keep cropping up again and again and again and again. Um, in Celtic uh, later Celtic mythology from the Irish mythological cycle we have the Dagda or the Doida, uh, the good god. He again is really similar in sort of attributes and appearance to Thor. Uh, he's got red hair, he's, he's quite stocky, he's actually got a bit of a belly as the Dagda. Uh, <laughs> he eats porridge. Uh, some of the stories of Thor involve him in a, in a kind of eating or drinking contest, so that kind of bit of similarity there. He's got this um, club this fertility club. It kills people with one end and it brings people back to life with the other end. Uh, again, as a folklorist, I'm thinking of um, Thor's 
goats which he kills and eats and then brings back to life again so he can kill and eat them again. So this resurrecting idea we see in Thor's cauldron, in the Dagda's cauldron and in the Dagda's club. Um, the Dagda is of course a fertility god because he has a massive, massive phallus literally on his body which drags along the ground and creates kind of the landscape of uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, so very uh, sort of eye-popping imagery there. Um, so the Dagda, uh, also red-bearded, strong god, uh, uh, who's also very, very jovial and also a bit like um, Thor, can be, a bit, can be a bit simple sometimes. Caveat here though, we don't know if that interpretation might have been added on by later Irish Christian writers. Similarly with Thor, when Thor appears quite simple, that might have just been Snorri Sturluson just making the tales a bit comic to make fun of the old heathen ways, because yes, we're Christian now. Coming back to Thunor, uh, the Anglo-Saxon god, um, what can we say of him? Because there's so little source material. Well, we know he was popular in Anglo-Saxon England, because there's heaps of place names named after Thunor with th in the title. He obviously gives his uh, name to the day of the week, Thursday, Thunor's Dag. Um, so he's obviously popular in that respect, as popular as uh, Woden or uh, Frigg. Uh, the oak tree also would have been sacred to Thunor, uh, one can only presume, because in uh, Germany at around Christianization, lots of early Christians were going around burning Thor's oak or burning Jupiter's oak, another example of them being the same god. Um, even today, uh, actually, in sort of a popular English folk magic, if there's an oak tree struck by lightning and it survives, uh, then that's a, a, a tree that, that, that you might want to take a piece of to make ritual objects out of, like staves and wands and things like that, or little um, protective amulets, because uh, it's strong enough to withstand being struck by lightning and it has the power of uh, of, of the storm god in it. So that, that could be, in English folk magic, a, a remnant of, uh, of uh, 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 earlier pagan imagination. Uh, finally, I want to talk about Thor's hammer, because it's not always a hammer, is it? It is in later Scandinavian sources, but sometimes um, we've got a thunderbolt, like with uh, like Zeus's thunderbolt. Uh, sometimes we've got a club, like with Hercules, or with, um, or with the Dagda. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a two-headed battle axe, and some people have a theory that Thor's hammer was originally actually a double-headed battle axe. I think Perkonos has a, um, a flaming, um, lightning-covered battle axe. I think that's his weapon that also returns to his hand. Uh, Indra, it's usually, uh, it's usually a lightning bolt, but also returning to his hand. But some people have a theory that this is actually a remnant, a Bronze Age remnant of a Bronze Age sacred object, uh, i.e. bronze itself, i.e. just that the metal, which is made from fire, you know, it's made from smelting tin and copper together, almost by magic, with, with a divine fire, you then make a weapon. And this is symbolically represented by an axe head, the axe that hews the oak tree. Imagine how much easier it was to take down a tree with a bronze axe instead of a stone axe, much quicker. Um, so this was a revolutionary tool for our ancestors, both a weapon and a tool, and it seems like it's like it's divine, like it's come from the gods. Um, so some people theorise that all these weapons, whether club, whether two-handed axe, whether um, lightning bolt, whether hammer, all these originated with this original Bronze Age axe head. Uh, which at the end of the Bronze Age become almost currency, almost like a ritual object. We find hordes of them, uh, and we don't know whether they had, yeah, uh, whether they were just straight up currency, or, or or whether they had some kind of ritual function connected to um, for this idea. So uh, I leave that one with you. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this um, because I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not really an archaeologist. I'm a folklorist, so. Uh, other people might have different ideas, but folklorically, that makes sense to me. And it's so interesting following all these thunder gods back in time to some, to some uh, theorised original thunder god that would have seeded all these other thunder champions across, um, across Europe. So, uh, 
Thor, uh, a good, a good God, a friend of man. Finally, I'm just going to end with a, a slightly comic story involving Thor. Thor's always going off and smashing giants and trolls and things like that in the Norse stories. And I imagine that was also true of uh, Thunor. Uh, there's this one story, though, that still probably maintains a lot of uh, its original mythic element. It, it's 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 Icelandic. It's it's one of Snorri's. It's from the Prose Edda, and it's when it's when Thor's hammer is stolen by giants. Maybe Loki had something to do about it. He probably did. But anyway, um, L Loki hatches a plot. <laughs> Loki probably loved this for Thor to get the hammer back. Basically, uh, the giants or the king of the giants, whose name eludes me, will only agree to give Thor's hammer back if uh, the giant king can marry uh, Frigg, the goddess of love, the most beautiful of all the goddesses, um, who, of course, thinks the idea is horrid and refuses. But Loki has a plan. Thor is going to dress up in Frigg's clothes. He's going to dress up as a woman. Thor goes to the wedding feast and the giants are kind of bemused that Thor has such burning red eyes. Again, that are very, very, just like Indra, just like Perkanos. He's just drinking so much ale and mead and eating so much. And Loki says, oh, well, you know, Frigg hasn't slept for days because she's been so eager to come and meet you. Then the hammer, Thor's hammer is placed in Thor's lap. This is possibly a very old fertility ritual done during marriages. So that could be a very old remnant. Of course, once Thor's got the hammer back, he rips off his clothes and smashes all the giants into oblivion because he that's what Thor does best, hit stuff. Um, so this idea of the hammer, the fertility icon being linked to um, marriage and birth we see that in ritual and also death we see that in the anglo-saxon grave burials we see thor's hammer on a lot of them also showing that this fertility ritual is connected to death as well or that door that, that that thor is a god who has his mark over all aspects of human life so in a way the most popular god in a way we also see swastikas on a lot of those grave burials because the swastika is of course a symbol of um lightning uh, uh uh just like the chariot wheel that's kind of what it represents shame that symbol's been uh, uh misrepresented again going back to that funny austrian bloke with the mustache originally it, it was a symbol of those that have been blessed by thor interestingly in India, uh, it's also associated with Indra, but also the cycle of Sansara, the cycle of death and rebirth. So it's interesting that on Anglo-Saxon graves, we also have the swastika. Maybe, maybe, because death and rebirth was also part of the belief system of the ancient Germanic peoples, just as it was the ancient Celtic peoples. And that has been preserved in India, but lost in the West. So just a little thought to leave you with there. So guys, today is Thursday, the day of the god Thunor. All hail the thunder god, defender of man. I'll see you later. Thank you. <laughs>